I think there will be a period of suffering um, globally in terms of economies because of what's happening with the coronavirus. You know, if you if you dampen uh, consumer demand so much, and especially in China, that is a consumer demand and debt led economy. If you take away consumer demand, you're going to have a massive demand shock. That's going to have an impact. And when China sneezes, the rest of the world definitely catches a cold. Prime Minister has announced the most drastic limits to our lives. Stay at home and stay at least two metres away from people. The NHS will not be able to cope with the lives. Social distancing has become the new norm. Cafes and shops are vacant. They've obviously shut down about half the US economy. Not only are stocks going down, gold is going down, credit's going down. At this point, it's clear that we're going to have a recession that's more severe than the global financial crisis. We are looking at other available options. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to another episode of Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And here we are live from the Crypto Compare Digital Asset Summit 2020, an amazing conference and people showing up, lots of love and great, great speakers. And speaking of great people, we have an awesome guest for another timeless interview, Josh Goodbuddy, Director of Growth at Binance. A pleasure to have you, my pleasure friend. Pleasure to be here, my friend. This is... A pretty spectacular setup you've got here. I love it. Can't complain. And right? not even that, you have changed the color of the Bitcoin thing. I, I'm appreciative. Customization, yeah, right? I love it. That I was love a it. lucky one right yeah. before the show. Right, right. Great to have you here, buddy. And just now we're talking about one of your stories. Right. Which was quite interesting then how you got into crypto. Do you mind just saying that again? That was quite Absolutely. Fun. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a boring guy, okay? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade, okay? I'm sorry. Um, so I spent the last 10, 12 years being a lawyer. Um, and, you know, the life of a lawyer is relatively pedestrian. Um, and I was at a fintech company and we were working with precious metals and base metals and doing all kinds of interesting technological feats in the metal space. And, and one day, one of our biggest clients came in and said, he's a Russian guy. I'm not going to even bother trying to do a Russian accent, but he's a Russian guy. And he said, uh, you know, I've got X amount of gold. I've got a warehouse of aluminium in Hong Kong. I've got some platinum. I've got palladium. I want you guys to tokenize this for me. And this was in early 2017. So this was before, you know, tokenizing metals was even a thing, before it was even cool. And so we all sat there, you know, these relatively uh, old school commodities traders and myself, a lawyer, and we, we said, what, what the hell is this guy talking about? And so we took a little bit of a look at it, right? And we thought, okay, we're gonna do this. So we did the first ever tokenization of precious metals back in early 2017. And I can safely say that that was, that was the blockchain bug for me. That's when it hit me and I thought, holy crap, like this can do so many things in so many different sectors. So that for me was the hook that got me into all the things that I'm doing today. That's really, really fascinating. And in, by the way, lawyers are cool, man. Harvey Specter suits, right? Except you have the cool suits and the cool tie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have, we have cool suits. That's about it. That's, yeah. That's about it. Yeah. So you, you saw that, you heard that idea of tokenization and all of a sudden you're like, what the hell is going on? What have I been missing? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the way that, that we think from the traditional finance sector is we are so conditioned in thinking in certain ways. You know, we, we've been doing things in a certain way for a long, long period of time and we don't really question why we do them. We don't challenge that there could be better ways to do it. Or at least the actual process of challenging that takes a long, long time. So, you know, when I was a lawyer at State Street, which is a large custodian, we were talking about blockchain. You know, we, we knew it existed. We knew Bitcoin existed. Were we anywhere near to doing anything with it? No, because talking about it takes years and years. So 
one I saw in that first kind of exposure was you can do a hell of a lot of practical things with this technology and you can really change the way certain industries work, certain asset classes can be traded or swapped or uh, title transferred over blockchain. There's all manner of possibilities here. So I think when I first saw that, I thought, I want to be involved in that space. I really want to give it a go at least. Um, and thankfully, and I, this is very rarely the case, lawyers in the blockchain space were in demand at that time. So thankfully there was a, a bit of an angle to work there, which is how the hell do we operate in this new industry in a complete and utter absence of law, regulation and clarity. So for me, that was a bit of a boon in you know late 2017. It was a good way to get into the space. As a guy who practiced law, like when you hear like quotes like code is law, is that really hard to get when you hear that type of stuff? You're like, what? I mean, it sounds great. It's it's a lovely soundbite. Um, <laughs> what it actually means in practice, I'm not so sure yet. Um, you know, we constantly get bashed on the head uh, by different people saying, oh, at some point you're going to be redundant. This will all be done by a machine. AI is developing into this wonderful thing that will make lawyers redundant. How great is that going to be? <laughs> um, and we always say, look, you know, to some extent, maybe there will be elements of what we did as lawyers that don't need to be done by humans anymore. And that's wonderful. We can free up our time to do more impactful things. Um, the code is law thing, I'm not entirely sure what that means. I do understand some of the debate around, you know, smart contracts being progra pro programmable, yeah, programmable. programmable. Yeah. Um, legal contracts, that is absolutely an area I think that's going to evolve over time. So you'll end up executing these kind of legal frameworks via a smart contract. Um, and that's that's fascinating in many ways, but I don't think we're seeing the end of lawyers just yet. Mm, that's so, that's we'll a really see. good point. We'll yeah. See. Yeah. Everyone is believing that it'll be fully automated and yeah. without law, but uh, we're human beings, right? Indeed. So yeah. As, yeah. Long, as long as we're emotional human beings, that, that's a really good point. And so when you jumped into that, so you knew about Bitcoin, but it was the commodities that really got you interested. Sure. Uh, are there any other asset classes that really felt like, okay, I'm done, I'm going into this crazy crypto mm. space? So I, <laughs> I ended up first working um, at, at Huobi Global, actually, yeah, in 2018. I so I joined that. Huobi to help them build their global business and set up an institutional business. And as we met with institutional counterparties, you start learning about what are the things that really cause them a hard time. And, and very quickly, we realized the entire payments infrastructure is, is, is really old and full of friction and full of fees and layers of you know, intermediaries. It's just really bloody inefficient. Mm -hmm. So over time, I realized, well, the whole stable coins industry is going to boom. And because there are inherent benefits in making things easier to transfer, cheaper to transfer, quicker to transfer, that applies at a company level. It makes intercompany transfers easier at a nation state level, at a peer to peer level. There are all these really transformational things that we can do with this technology. Um, so for me, Sounds boring, but I thought stable coins and the emergence of stable coins as a asset class of merit um, was really, really interesting. That is fascinating. In terms of stable yeah. coins, like there are some decentralized or yep. some centralized. Do you believe in both in terms of the way stable coins operate as of today? Are you still excited about the? Yeah, the no, absolutely. I mean, there's there's a time and a place, absolutely, for, for fiat backed stable coins. I think you know there there is absolutely uh, method in creating fiat back stable coins that serve all kinds of more highly regulated use cases. But at the same time, these decentralized stable coin frameworks like, for example, Equilibrium or like the Maker uh, build, those have interesting nuances that a fiat stable coin simply doesn't meet. Um, and I think as the sector expands, you're going to see fiat stable coins being used by certain sectors of uh, business and industry and decentralized stablecoins being used by others. Because ultimately, what, what, what lots of these decentralized stablecoin frameworks want to do is create utility with your assets. Mm -hmm. So you don't want, for example, with Maker, you don't want your Ethereum just to sit there. If you can accrue or create dollar value out of it and spend that and do things with it, uh, and also receive some kind of interest bearing um, product from it, that's, that's brilliant. It yeah. makes your assets more useful. So. You know, there are various iterations of it, but I think there's a place for, for both of those models, for that, sure. That's so true. Like this whole passive income, earning interest yeah. is massive topic for DeFi. Uh, in terms of DeFi itself, are there any other use cases that you see as very exciting or is it mainly stable coins as of today? Yeah, I mean, at Binance, we, we've been looking at, at, at DEXs. Yeah. Um, and Binance, you know, we have a DEX. We are 
constantly increasing the you know the assets that we're putting on there, the functionality that we uh, want to bring to the community via our decks, and you know, frankly speaking, the the growth of that market has been quite encouraging. It hasn't been big bang. It hasn't gone crazy overnight, and we didn't expect it to. And there are there are obvious reasons for that. The benefits of centralization are user journey, our ease of use. Conceptually, it makes sense. You know who you're dealing with, how it works, where your money's kept. You know it's sitting in an exchange wallet. You know what happens if you lose your phone, your exchange wallet will still hold on to your keys for you. You know, it's very, from a psychological perspective, extremely easy to understand. The decentralized world is a little bit different. So I think as an industry, and especially Binance ourselves, we're trying to create as much educational material as we can to talk about this because there are huge benefits in elements of decentralization, whether it is you know, controlling your own keys, uh, but also being able to via a DEX trade with other people, um, that's a no brainer, right? You, you remove elements of you know, being exposed to bad actors in the industry, for example, exchanges that simply are not very well run because you control your own keys. So you know, at Binance, we're super supportive of that. And we think that that space will grow and grow. My personal view is it will grow slowly because this is you know an already pretty drastic shift in a model that has taken a long while for people to get comfortable with anyway um, so i think dex is here to stay but it's going to take a bit of time before they start to usurp some of the centralized exchanges that we see in the market right now i mean what you said you just put it so well because you know like i do not want to hold all my cash and put it under my bed or right. have it you know lose the chances of losing my private keys, which I can't recover if I'm not on a centralized exchange. Yeah. And I remember like Ted Lin, who came on the show last year, he said that, you know, both will, you know, where you can take the best of both worlds depending on your use case, but they'll, they both will survive. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, like going to a public park with your kid where he can have fun, but he may fall and hurt himself or mm -hmm. go to Disneyland where you have people giving you customer service and a smile and et cetera, et cetera. Is it kind of like, I know it's a crazy analogy, I right? Like it. I like it's like it. public. Is that then... Ted's analogy? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get him to <laughs> Do tell you like me about it. it. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. Okay. Is, is that how you see the future? Like people just having two different options, none is going to beat the other. They'll just coexist. Or? I, don't, I don't think that one will beat the other, frankly. I, I, I don't think that one space will, you know, completely dominate the other space because they're really pitched at the moment at different use cases and users. Getting your average retail user to be comfortable holding their own keys in a way that you as an educator, for example, would be comfortable telling them how to do it is a real challenge. You know, are we comfortable as an industry telling someone Right, this is a non-custodial wallet that I'm giving you. After you've done this, write down your key, don't screenshot your keys, write down your keys on a piece of paper, put that in a vault or put that somewhere safe. There are so many uh, you know, things that can go wrong within that. And I feel like telling everybody that's how you must manage your keys is actually a bit irresponsible. There are certain services that some people should have and there are other services that are more suited to those people. So we really need to see a spectrum of services remain that cater for each type of person. Um, as much as I'd love to see everybody controlling their own keys and you know not being exposed to you know infrastructure losses or hacks or whatever, it's not a, a realistic um, goal. At least at this moment, until someone brings out something that perhaps you know is so wonderful in its user journey that it is actually able to do that. That would be so cool. Some sort of digital identity that yeah. can directly go to your keys where you don't have to remember the code or... I mean, we're thinking about stuff like that. You know, we, we are... But Binance is, you know, constantly thinking about ways to make our DEX experience better. Um, and part of what we're doing is, is reaching out to the community and saying, right, give us your ideas and we'll incubate them. We'll help you build them. So we're hoping to create that kind of community. But of course, this is a really kind of cerebral exercise we're going through here. Um, a large amount of the population are just getting comfortable with using these centralized structures. So kind of pushing them in the other direction and going, play a little bit around with this uh, decentralized infrastructure that we've built is, it's a challenge, absolutely. And I think it's down to people like us to kind of talk about it a bit more and say, you know, as much as it sounds scary, it isn't scary. Yeah, that's so true. Like a keyless world would be great, you know, with right. some sort of connection to identity. I hope you guys can innovate that on that. Mm. And speaking of which, 
why is Binance so good at innovating? I mean, obviously you guys are not the first exchange. Sure. It came pretty late. Was it 2017, 2017 right? 2017, yeah. We're, we're, we're not even three years old. Not even three years old. Yeah. But yeah. the expansion has been mind-blowing. Is it that creativity or, or that thinking outside the box that's mm. driving all this innovation? Or Yeah, I mean, Binance is, is very rare in the sense that the organization, and, and, I, and a lot of people take the piss out of this, the organization is truly decentralized. We do not have a headquarters as such. We, we simply don't. People don't believe us, but we don't. And I tell you what, it works extremely well. Why does it work well? Because what the leadership team have managed to do over the last couple of years is hire the right people. And in hiring the right people, you empower them to get on and do things. And so even though I may not see another member of the executive team in six months, I may not have any face-to-face -face contact with them. I'll speak with them every single day. And in doing that, we're sharing ideas, swapping, uh, you know, tips on how to do certain things and, and building products together. And I'm doing it here in London and someone may be doing it in Singapore. And it works very, very well. But to do that, you have to have like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So I think the credit here really comes down to, to CZ uh, and, and Heiyi, the co-founder, in building this culture that allows people to play to their strengths, be a bit nimble in the way that they work, in the sense that if you can do it and we see you can do it, you'll have the opportunity to do it. And so that kind of slightly unstructured environment leads to a lot of innovation. And don't get me wrong, you know, sometimes we're not able to kind of keep track of all the things that we're innovating in. Um, and, and that's certainly not a problem yet, but I think it's, it's an area that we're trying to create a little bit more structure around because we bring products to market all the time. We open new localized services all the time. We've got a real focus on building out our Fiat products globally. And, it's really been a call to arms across the board in the company where we say, guys, these are our priorities. If you have an idea, bring it to us, we'll build this with you, but you get to lead it. So you get the credit for this thing. So we don't work in a siloed environment. We let people kind of take an idea and run with it. And, we, and you know, we as the, the leadership team try and support them in doing that. I think that's really where yeah. this innovation comes from because a lot of companies and all the places I've worked previously have a bit of a, a vertical. A, yeah, they yeah. have verticals and people sit in their silo and, you know, someone would say to you, that's not your job, is it, to do this? And if someone says that, you know there's something wrong because you're stifling other people's innovation and creativity. So we so far have found a way to, to kind of foster that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we can do better um, in giving people the support they need to be able to do these things, but it is... You know, it's Binance 101. That is that is the kind of culture that CZ and Hey have tried to create. Um, and it really means we're able to kind of grow very quickly. And some people call it blitz scaling. That's really, you know, the way that we, we see our building. We build fast, build quickly, uh, and do it on as many fronts as we possibly can. It's incredible because, yeah, that speed of innovation, it makes sense, this cross-divisional kind of breaking out of these verticals that yeah. limit people, you know, really brings in new ideas and fresh Absolutely. Uh, stuff and you guys the coin the decks always the first mover in every single mm. thing so that's incredible but you were just talking about like how you're very decentralized across the world two questions came up to my mind number one is what are the differences you've seen among the cultures in general because mm. you have such a a great you know eye perspective uh, and number two we're in the UK mm -hmm. as you know Brexit was a massive deal and a lot of people are debating whether this is good or bad for crypto. Mm. Sorry, many questions out once. I like once. it. No, yeah. they're good. They're really good. So, all right. Well, let's talk about culture first. I think um, we're a global company. We have members of staff in, in over 100 different countries. Um, we, we're 800 strong. So we're a large company. And, and within that, of course, inevitably, you get a real spectrum of cultures, right? And people do things in different ways and people work in certain ways. Nonetheless, you need to hire the right people that all work together and will sing from the same hymn sheet, right? Mm. Now, when you apply that to, to the business, how do we grow our business from being present everywhere, but not necessarily being physically present somewhere? We've realized that this year we need to localize elements of our business. We want to create a more close connection to the communities that we have contact with. We want to have more people on the ground. We want to have more support for our clients. And that means we set ourselves up in more in more regions. And we're really you know, going full, um, full speed ahead on, on localizing. That really is one of our core strategies for this year. The key for that is understanding the local culture. Now, what a lot of corporates do when they expand globally is they go, this is how we run the business. These are the products we have, and we take them to every place we want to build it, and we 
dump them and we say, off you go, sales team, go sell this thing. That doesn't work. Doesn't work so we yeah. end up taking a lot of time and sometimes we're slower than others to build localized um, offerings. You know, we have to take into account all elements of what it is to build a local product. You know, whether that is the way that the user journey works, whether it's the way our customer service look after them, whether it's the way that they, uh, you know, have more transparency on, for example, where we're set up or how their funds are kept. There is a nuance to each jurisdiction. Yeah. And so we're taking very much a, a particular view for each jurisdiction that we're looking at and going, we're going to build a localized product for that. Mm. That's a challenge for us because we've grown globally mm. and now we're localizing. So yeah, the global, right? <laughs> we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Think, think global, act local. And we have yeah. to do that. And, and we know that. And that's one of the core focuses for the next couple of quarters. Um, so then to go to your point about um, Brexit. Mm. <laughs> And it's actually quite nice that we haven't spoken about Brexit very much recently. I yeah, like, I know, it's crazy. I feel like all, all of the buzz around it has like, Gone, died down. Yeah. Excellent. I think that's, <laughs> that's refreshing. But, you know, regardless of that, Brexit's a challenge, right? Because it, it has created, at least for the past few years, a, a real hesitance in certain economies to come here and invest. Mm. Because their, their question is, what does it mean? What can I do? What can't I do? Do I have access to the European market? How would that work? There's a lot of ifs and buts and whens, and uh, those are unknowns. And there are still a lot of unknowns, no doubt about that at all. But we have certainty now. That certainty is that we have left the European Union. We're in a transition period. What the post-transition period will look like, we do not know. But that's okay, because that comfort alone is enough for enough people to come here and go, I'm going to invest here, not only because I think that this is a great place to have a presence within the European area, also, London has massive, you know, massive strengths in terms of, um, you know, the skill sets that, that, that people have here coming out of universities, the labor market we have, the local infrastructure, the entrepreneurial economy that we have here. The blockchain devs. The, uh, have <laughs> huge amounts of like blockchain talent here yeah, in London. Absolutely. And I saw a report this morning, actually, where it said that the, the second best fintech hub as voted by entrepreneurs is London. So Singapore, number one, because it's super easy to set up and it's very entrepreneurially minded. Uh, London coming in at number two. Um, and that's a theme that I'm seeing across the market. You know, we go to the US and we speak to some clients there um, and we say, you know, what are you guys up to? Where are you bringing your business? And they go, actually, we're going to set up in London. So I think that clarity that Brexit has brought, i.e. it's happening, is letting people think a little bit more long term now. So it's gone from being a bit of a shackle around the neck to being actually a bit of a bit of a benefit because now we can talk about things in terms of we know what the state of play here is as it pertains to regulation right we know what re regulation is in the uk we know what the laws are we know what needs to be done in the blockchain economy here to build a business what we don't know is how we'll be able to be a bit more nimble versus the european countries mm -hmm. in regulating deregulating changing regulation but ultimately people know that in the uk we have a history of doing that so that has caused a lot of interest, I'd say, especially in the APAP market, where people have gone, okay, I can see two, two power centers here, Singapore and London, and we're going to start investing in London. So actually, it's, it's a really positive message that we've seen from, from a lot of the community, um, which is we're going to bring business to London. That sounds really good. And the FC, actually, they classify cryptocurrency as similar to a commodity, right? Uh, to uh, real estate, right? Basically, like that was kind of their definition. And... In well, yeah, of... yeah. So, so, so the legal clarity around what what uh, what crypto is, um, especially Bitcoin, obvious example. It, it is it is legal title. It's it's um, it is a it's an asset, it's an asset right? Yeah. It's an asset that has the protection of the law. So that's helpful. I mean, we already kind of knew that, but it's helpful having that you know declared in a court, so people can use that you know with uh, with a bit of comfort. Um, the FCA have done a good job at really explaining where certain instruments would fit within the existing infrastructure. So what the FCA haven't done versus other jurisdictions is create a framework specific yeah, to crypto. They haven't done yeah. that. You've seen that done in Switzerland, in Switzerland of yeah. course, one of the early guys doing that. The AMF in France, the BaFin in Germany as well have created a crypto specific oh. regime. That's fine. But actually what the FCA have done is they've said, right, we're going to give you clarity on what's out there right now. This is what we believe utility tokens should look like. This is what we believe security tokens uh, look and feel like. Um, this is what we believe payment tokens look like. And this is how they fit within the existing regulatory infrastructure. So 
it's almost a question of we haven't needed anything new, we've just needed clarity and a bit of um, reference points. And so they've given that to the industry. So people kind of know where they are in the UK, which is, is refreshing, I think, because they can start building their products knowing what they are, right? And for those reasons, do you believe Brexit is overall, overall a positive phenomenon for crypto? I think for crypto, yes. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on, on Brexit as it affects other areas of the economy. Um, but I do think for crypto, it gives us a bit of an edge because we have the opportunity at least to try and consolidate a really powerful fintech sector here. And so far, the signals from the government have been quite positive. They're listening to us. You know, they're asking us to come in and talk to them about, you know, what does the digital economy look like? How can we support a digital economy? So they're listening. Whether they'll do something is, is, is the next question. <laughs> we'll have to see, right? But nonetheless, it's looking quite positive. Um, and we think, at least from our perspective and Binance's perspective, there's, there's an opportunity there. Absolutely. And you were just mentioning the utility tokens. You know, a lot of institutions, and you've dealt with many, they really struggle to understand the value of a coin or a token. Mm. Um, in, in your views, like, is this like a Bitcoin phenomenon or do you really see crypto as an asset class as of today with different sub-asset classes within that? Yeah, interesting question. I think, you know, no doubt that <clears throat> crypto is an asset class in itself. Now, a trader would probably break that down into, okay, within all those, within that asset class, you have sub-asset classes. You will have some cryptos that behave like commodities sometimes not all the time you have other cryptos that are simple payment tokens mm -hmm. so yes it is an asset class in the sense that it's an investable asset class you can say i invest in crypto um, but i think a lot of you talked about institutions a lot of institutions really are only interested in bitcoin, bitcoin because yeah. they can understand it more we've got uh, more sophisticated products out there in the market whether it's derivatives whether futures, options, perpetual swaps. You've got ETFs out here in, or ETNs here in Europe as well. So you have a pretty diverse portfolio or access to a portfolio of pretty sophisticated tools to get crypto exposure in different ways. That has started over the last year and a half and continues to grow. Um, and we think that's going to be an area that, you know, continues flourishing. And, you know, Binance put out its, its futures platform in September last year. Um, you know, we hit $5 billion of daily traded volume a couple of days ago. Right. That shows the, the level of interest. Um, it's useful for hedging, so it has a utility value there. It's useful for speculation as well. So we think that that is a theme. Derivatives are going to be a very, very big, um, big theme for this year as well. Yeah, derivatives have been massive, right? Yeah. It's been like the headline for many. Um, and do you feel like attracting these institutional investors? Some people are worried that because institutional investors don't really fully sometimes believe in Bitcoin mm. uh, as you know a new form of money, money 2.0 or digital gold, but more they're interested in price action. Sure. So you know if they see a little bit of a trend, they will short, they will sell, mm. affecting Bitcoin's core, you know, non-correlated asymmetric risk mm. return asset. Uh, what are the pros and cons? Do you do you see it, or or is it just, mm. or am I kind of exaggerating a little no, bit? No, I think you know I think th th there is there's a there's a concern that comes with the maximalists in the space that is all this mad speculation around Bitcoin kind of overlooks the fundamental utility that Bitcoin was created for. Mm. Was it ever intended for a, I don't know, a Bitcoin future to be traded on CME? I don't know. Does it really matter though? I think is the question, right? You know, we, we see, you know, we see a lot of use cases for Bitcoin and we, we see increasing demand to build products that are used for speculation. And I think that's the nature of the beast. If you make a market, if you create an exchange, it's going to be traded. And at some point when that market gets big enough, you're going to have the bigger boys in the room come in and they will be the HFTs, the prop traders, the hedge funds. So personally speaking, I, I don't have a problem with them entering the space because I think overall that creates a level of innovation that wouldn't be accessible to retail users like myself without that investment going in at that kind of institutional level. Um, now I'll tell you one, one way we differ from other exchanges. Um, what we've seen across the crypto space, especially in the spot markets, is a bit of a race to the bottom to provide as much as possibly can um, for institutional investors. So what I mean by that is, right, you're an HFT trader, your number one priority is to trade with low latency. So that means you wanna connect straight into my order book you want to be in the same cloud environment. You want to be co-located. You want to have zero latency, zero latency right? Yeah. 
that's fine. That's what institutions expect. And you tend to see that in institutional markets when they're, you know, getting uh, co-located with a stock exchange or a commodities market or whatever. But the market they're connecting with is primarily an institutional market. What we're talking about here in the crypto space is you've got a commingling of retail flow and institutional flow all within one market. If you look at what Binance has right now, it's a retail flow as well as institutional flow. They live symbiotically together, right? Now, what we haven't done is we haven't opened the floodgates of technology and said to institutions, you can co-locate with us and have low latency access to our spot exchange. And that sounds like such a small deal, but it's not because it, it basically preserves the level playing field where people can trade on merit and on the skills they have versus technological advantages that give them the edge, right? So as a retail trader on Binance, you know that at no point will you be competing on latency. Mm. That's very important for us because we're retail focused originally as a company and we still really want to support the retail markets as closely as we possibly can. And so we want to keep that level playing field. And I want to just point that out because that's a real difference yeah, versus other markets. It's really important. Right? Yeah. It's really and speaking of that level playing field, you know, in the future, and obviously you don't have a crystal ball, but a lot of people are worried that it's going to be the, bat the battle of the bots. So like at one point, people will just be coding algos to be a better trader than the physical person. Mm -hmm. And it will just be people trying to code a better algo and just fighting through algos and the actual job as a trader will s slowly start to fade out. Is that too far-fetched again or? <laughs> uh, no, actually, I don't think, I, I don't think we're gonna see a, a complete, um, what's the word I'd use? A complete kind of lack of traders being needed in the market. There will always be traders, yeah. but the inevitable, I think, move towards a more algorithmically led market where bots are doing a large amount of the uh, volume. trading volume, I think is a natural consequence of, of where we're going. Um, now, we've seen that in, in many other markets. You know, we've seen that in the FX space. Yeah. We've seen that in the commodities space. Yeah. You know, if you look at the trading floor of a, a you know, a commodities uh, trading house versus uh, what it was 20 years ago, you'd have 50 traders. Now you might have three traders. Three traders and yeah. then the rest yeah. are, you know, quants and, and developers creating electronic strategies and that is just an inevitability no, of yeah. technological innovation and progress i don't think human traders are going anywhere they will always be in existence Psychological. but i think you know there will be more access especially at the retail level to more sophistication so people will be building tools to give retail users the ability to have access to these kind of technologies that they previously haven't had access to. And I think that's a good thing, frankly. Mm, yeah, the more the tools, I mean, the more interesting. Yeah. And the, there's so much to, to actually be built. And speaking of what's going to happen in the future, and I know you cannot disclose like internal news, but if you could just tell us like a little bit, how, what is 2020 going to be like for us? If possible, 2021, 2022. So 20, yeah. <laughs> or what would you love to see? Like maybe the Ooh, current limitations. Yeah. And <laughs> well, 2021 is a long, long it's way a long away. Way. <laughs> um, Binance, we think, you know, three weeks ahead. Yeah. Kind of think three weeks to three months. Um, what are you going to see this year from us? A lot of growth. Uh, we're going to be um, more present in a, in a number of places. We're going to be boots on the ground in a number of places, uh, both in Europe, in Latin America, in, in Asia. We're supporting, you know, all of the existing partner and um, infrastructure investments we've made to date, whether those are with exchanges like Wazarex in India. We're really going to be building out our presence there and supporting emerging economies. That's a real theme. So you'll see us do some quite <clears throat> interesting things in the emerging economy space because we think the future is going to be in those large countries which are primarily unbanked. So. Watch, watch that as a, as a general theme. We're going to be doing some very stuff cool. in, in that space, which will be very interesting. Um, we haven't forgotten about our retail clients at all. We're, we're building some very interesting retail um, focused products that we'll be bringing to market in the next couple of months. Those will fundamentally change the way that you'll interact with our, um, our exchange. So keep an eye Ooh. out for that. Can't give any more information oh, either, damn. unfortunately. <laughs> um, and we'll continue innovating in terms of the products that we're bringing to market. You know, our... Our derivatives team are busy at work building new um, derivatives contracts, um, whether that's options uh, or other futures contracts, those will be coming to market soon. So I think the general theme that you've, you noted earlier was we're building products all the time. That's gonna continue. We're not slowing down, we're not stopping, we're continuing to build. 
Um, so that's going to be a real theme for this year. But we're not just building the product. We're going to build the teams as well. And we're going to be a bit more present locally. So ahead of that, 2021, I couldn't even <laughs> try and predict where we'll be. Um, I hope, you know, we'll, we'll be a larger team. You know, we're 800 strong now. Um, inevitably, we'll be hiring uh, as we go. We've got roles all over the place right now that we're actively hiring for. Um, so, you know, we're very much saying to people, get involved. Now's the time. We're building. Um, even though the market's funny, we're still building, you know. Um, so 2021, I'm not even going to bother guessing. No <laughs> idea. I've got no idea. It's true, uh, especially yeah. with, with everything that's going on. And, you know, some people see a financial crisis. And it, do, are, are those little concerns of yours, like a uh, financial crisis or recession, as people are all worried about? Or or still, it's it's not... It's just a little obstacle. There. Yeah, I, I don't know, to be totally honest with you. I I can see some serious headwinds in the markets. I mean, God, we've had the most monumental equities bull run for the last God knows how many years. Yeah, it's crazy. The market is so was so overheated that something had to happen. There had to be a correction event. Now, did we think the correction event would be so severe as the one we've recently seen? Probably not. Um, but I think there will be a period of suffering um, globally in terms of economies because of what's happening with the coronavirus. You know, if you if you dampen uh, consumer demand so much, and especially in China, that is a consumer demand and debt led economy. Mm. If you take away consumer demand, you're going to have a massive demand shock. Mm. That's going to have an impact. And when China sneezes, the rest of the world definitely catches a cold. Right. Mm. So I think we're going to see weakening global economies. Um, the markets are probably not going to pick up for a long, long time. Uh, there's going to be a lot of volatility. So uh, I think that'll be a bit of a trend for, for, for the foreseeable. How long that is, six months, nine months, I really don't know. But I think it will have an effect. What will be interesting is to see whether that has a knock-on effect in the crypto market. Mm -hmm. um, I think the jury's out as to how Bitcoin behaves. You know, is, 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 is Bitcoin a safe haven asset? Well, not today. It's not behaving like that today, fingers crossed. I think, you know, where, where we're going with that, that debate is the consensus is kind of Bitcoin may become a safe haven asset, but it's not there just not yet. There just yet. It yeah. behaves in certain moments like a safe haven asset. Like I'll give you one example that, that was quite cool that our research team pointed out recently. We looked at, we looked at a, an event which shocks the markets, right? When General Soleimani was assassinated um, in, in Iraq, so the Iranian general who's assassinated by a U.S. missile strike, everyone thought, especially the market, war is, war coming, is coming, right? Yeah. So the markets went bonkers that day. What did Bitcoin do? Yeah, it went, went up, up immediately. extremely yeah. quickly. And it followed the kind of correlation with gold, with other safe haven assets like T-bills, that kind of stuff. So, and then you zoom out a little bit and you look at all these events within that crisis where there was some kind of announcement that was negative or an announcement that was positive. And Bitcoin was quite broadly correlated to, to that and it behaved in a non-correlated way to the equities markets. Mm -hmm. So in that one little segment, in that one scenario, it behaved really nicely. Yeah. But unfortunately like, when, yeah, I know, like, it was a no. big win, yeah. <laughs> and then you look at the way it's behaved during the corona market, it, it unfortunately hasn't behaved like a safe haven asset would. I mean, gold's been more or less flat with a little uptick, you know, hasn't behaved like that. To expect it to behave like that is premature. Mm -hmm. I think we're moving in that direction. And as much as the adoption continues to grow and more products get brought to market like ETFs, it'll start developing that kind of characteristic. But it's not there yet. Yeah, it still needs to prove itself, right? And Absolutely. but there's something that's really interesting is like Bitcoin corrected over the weekend. And as you know, markets actually sleep on weekends, but mm. crypto never sleeps. But then Monday, opening the markets, everything else crashed. So it's yeah. almost like, oh, if you guys could see that, I could have shorted here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, what we've seen in the last few days is Bitcoin behaving like any other volatile asset. Yeah. People have been deleveraging. People have people need cash. Or maybe they're more happy putting things in cash right now than having it in a, in, in a volatile asset. So people have been pulling their Bitcoin out of the market. Um It'll be a very interesting couple of days, I think. For yeah, us, so, definitely. Yeah. I really look forward to seeing that. And thank you so much, Josh, for today. If people want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to reach out? Yeah, good question. Um, definitely Twitter, Twitter. I think. Uh, Twitter, yeah. I'm at Josh Goodbody. Um, feel free to add me. I'm not usually saying particularly interesting or wise things. 
uh, but I'm there, so I'm fair game. So do do reach out and add me if you want to. That's awesome. Yeah. And if people around the world want to support Binance, the team, they're interested in working for Binance. Yeah. What are some good uh, channels to reach out? Yeah, I mean, look, we we post every single job on LinkedIn. So everything we're hiring for all is is on LinkedIn. Um, via LinkedIn, you have obviously access to our recruitment team, who are super lovely and will answer any question you have about the job. Um, so if you are interested in working for us, awesome. Check it out on LinkedIn. All the job adverts are up there. Um, and we definitely encourage you to give it a go. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ashka, buddy. Thank it was you, a my great, friend. great pleasure and a very, pleasure. very educational. Guys, if you like, don't forget to hit the like button, blast that bell notification. Don't forget to comment as well and join us every Wednesday premiering at 8 o'clock GMT at a computer near you. Thank you so much, guys.